Medic Life episode 21. Reddit, uh, YouTube, heck, Facebook, and even Twitter. Do we really live and die by social media? Yes, I'm coming to you live from Mistletoe State Park, where you're going to cut off the social media and hit the trails. Hey, enjoy this week's episode. My name is John Newton, and thanks for watching, guys. This is Medic Life, a weekly video podcast for EMS professionals, bringing you real-world knowledge about today's EMS with your host, John Newton. Live for this time for your weekly dose of Medic Life, where we delve into everyday topics in EMS. I'm your host, John Newton, here with my host, Marty D. And uh, this week, we're going to talk a little bit about social media. Yeah, I know it's kind of been done, but I'm going to give you a little different spin and tell you about some stuff that I did this week uh, with social media. And uh, yes, we're going to have some mystery topic. Who knows? Marty D's going to got some stuff maybe cooking up in the old nugget there for us. And if you see the little guy down there in the bottom, that's Clint. I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name, guy, but I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, so if this is your first time watching or listening, then thanks for coming. Come on back often and feel free to subscribe on uh, the old YouTube and iTunes there. You can even follow me at jnewton underscore dcme. And as always, down in the bottom there, in the old description, you can find all of this information. Marty. Evening in Texas there, buddy. Like the Star Wars shirt or Star Texas. Yeah, let everybody see your shirt there. <laughs> I'm kick I'm ro roll tide, guys. Yeah, it's that I'm week. Kidding. Marty's a big Notre Dame fan, so he's been giving me a little heck uh, over the last few weeks and stuff. But uh, I thought this week we'd do something a little different. You ready for the show tonight, Marty? I'm ready. You excited? I'm very excited. I think uh, Clint is not really sure what to expect. He's never really been part of one of these episodes, so uh, we'll try not to make it too painful for you there, bud. Uh, but uh, okay, we're going to talk a little bit about social media, and then I'm going to turn you loose, Marty. It's all about you. You're going to pick some mystery topics. So first off, social media. You guys uh, mess around on social media too much? Well, before we go into social media, I'd love to learn more about what Clint does. Yeah, that's a good idea, man. Tell us about you a little bit, Clint. I totally forgot. Sorry about that. So that's what you're there for, no. Marty. It's all right. Uh, so my name is Clint Klepping, and uh, I'm a flight paramedic in Nebraska, the United States of America. Uh, I say that for any international folks that might be listening. I do a lot of Twitter, and mostly Twitter, not really as much on Facebook. I work for um, a company that's uh, private. We have three helicopters currently expanding right now uh, and doing a lot more. I do, I do fly clinically, but I'm also doing clinical education uh, on the side for the the same company so I do that and uh, I work with John as well so I do a lot of teaching and a lot of clinical education I do two clinical shifts a week plus teaching what's your Twitter name at no DSAT at what no DSAT no DSAT yes so and true commitment to the uh, to the Twitter handle it's also my uh, my license plate too really hey, that's kind of yes. cool Yes. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You used to live not far from me here in Augusta, Georgia, right? Didn't you used to live in uh, South Carolina somewhere? Uh, I used to live in North Carolina, just about uh, 35 minutes north of Fort Bragg. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. So I did. I lived there for six years in North Carolina, and then we, we moved out here in September of last year, right after we had uh, our second child. So there were very stressful times. Well, I gotta say, uh, we've been working together for a couple of years now. Uh, we, you know, emails through work and stuff. Uh, because of the company that we work for, Distant CME, we don't really we live all over the place. And uh, I can honestly say, uh, this is the first time I've seen your face. Uh, so <laughs> I know you have seen me through other stuff, but this is the first time I've seen your face. So I didn't really even know what you looked like. You know, if you'd have showed up like some hairy gorilla, I'd have been like, okay, well that's clear. I would have never known. You could yeah. You could have done anything you wanted to. I wouldn't know. I, I could have had my pilot sit in for me. So. <laughs> yeah, you could have I would have not known. I would have not known. Uh, and that might have been uh, a fun thing to do. 
Uh, well, it's his birthday today. Uh, my night pilot, it's his birthday today. So uh, he's, uh, we just we just had birthday dinner when you when you had sent me that message about Skype. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But I, we were finishing up birthday dinner. Well, give him a shout out. Say happy birthday to him. Who is he? Uh, happy birthday to our pilot here at Midwest Med Air, Richard Forrester. I won't say his age, but uh, he's young at heart. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Uh, it's good to get old. That means that you're surviving. It's okay. At least that's the that's I mean, the military, uh, uh, being uh, growing old is a privilege de denied to many. So that's something that we <laughs> we always embrace. Yeah. So you said you do Twitter, not so much with Facebook. Uh, you do, do you Periscope? Oh, yeah. I follow you on Periscope. Oh, do you? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I was trying it for a little bit, and I hadn't really messed with it. Do you mess with it, Marty, Periscope? No, I don't give any speeches. Do you guys, do, Clint, do you do Periscope while you're getting out the copter? Um, no, I haven't yet. Uh, that we probably should try that one. See what happens. I've never actually broadcast on Periscope. I've just watched things on Periscope. Would you uh, be allowed to do it? What's that? Would you be allowed to actually do it when you get in there? Probably. Um, if we were going on like a PR flight, you know, like we were going to some sort of a, a, a you know a health fair or something like that to show off the, the aircraft and stuff, we could probably do that. Probably not so much for a patient flight, like we're, if we're responding, obviously not with one on board, but yeah. Um, that would be perfect for education if you could do a periscope, kind of breaking people's chests open. <laughs> uh, Dr. DeCanto does it for um, difficult airways uh, in the OR, because I've watched him do that a couple of times. If you don't know who he is, um, he's up in Wisconsin, he's a, a chair of anesthesiology up there somewhere, and really, really into uh, difficult airway management and teaching and everything. Really awesome guy. Um, he actually does Periscope? Dr. DeCanto does, yeah. A lot of different physicians do. Um, Yen Chow does sometimes for his guys up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada, uh, whenever he's doing airway training and stuff. Uh, a lot of different things with regards to Periscope. Um, East Coast Helicopter Operations, a lot of times whenever they're doing some sort of education, they'll Periscope that. Uh, they Periscoped a lot of sessions at SMAC because people couldn't come to SMAC. So that will probably be the way I uh, uh, enjoy SMAC this year. Tell us what that stands for, what SMAC stands for. So SMAC stands for Social Media and Critical Care. And uh, it was a conference that came about a few years ago in Australia. And it was in Australia the first two years. It went to the Gold Coast of Australia the second year in 2000. Uh, 14, but then in 2015, it moved to Chicago. It was in Chicago this last year, and so all of us who are uh, FOMED enthusiasts all flocked to Chicago for a week to enjoy everything that FOMED has to offer. How many people showed up to that? Because I would never even guess that that would happen. Uh, more than 2,000 people. As a matter of fact, uh, um, as a matter of fact, on Twitter, I was, uh, at the end of the conference, number three on number of tweets for the conference. So I tweeted uh, on every device I had for the conference. So we, we just, a bunch of us just got together and decided we were just going to broadcast this thing. So it was fun. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, well, he was one of my paramedic instructors. Um, his name is uh, Rick Solis. He's actually a physician now. Um, he was a paramedic for a long time. He was... Uh, one of my mentors, we even rode together uh, for a little bit, and then he went off to school and stuff. And he was sending stuff, and I was like, what is he sending stuff? But he would send pictures of stuff uh, when I finally figured out what he was tweeting. Uh, but one of the coolest things was seeing some of the, because it is technology, was seeing some of the tech, how they've really kind of combined a lot of devices like the uh, – laryngoscope handles that basically you have a cord out of it and you can just plug it in into anything. Uh, the, um, for uh, sonography, it's just basically... Yeah, what about ultrasound? Ultrasound is becoming such a huge thing right it's now. It's crazy. He posted up a picture and I was like, what is that? It was the probe. It was like this big. And I'm like, my fingers are like two inches apart. Like this big was the probe and then there was like a cord and it was like you could plug it into your iPhone, your Android, a pad, a tablet, whatever. And I was wow. like, what is that? And it was just like, it was crazy. So, yeah, that's really cool that they have that conference. Uh, and they had one in Dublin, too, didn't they, uh, this year? 
They're having one in Dublin in June. It's actually um, going back to its origins. Um, there was a, uh, as the story goes, and I can't remember right off the top of my head, the, the physician who coined the term FOMED, free open access medical education, but it happened in Dublin. It was in a pub in Dublin. They were having a pint of Guinness. Of course, that's what you do when you're in Guinness, right? Uh, when you're in Dublin, rather, you have a Guinness. Yeah. And uh, so they were having a pint, and uh, he said, you know what, we need to make this uh, uh, available to everybody. And so uh, just like Christian Christianity became available to everybody and became free open access medical education. And uh, everybody's, uh, it's, the, it's the craze right now. And I have uh, drank the Kool-Aid, as they say, and so I'm uh, just as much a part of it as anyone else. I will say I haven't completely drank the Kool-Aid. I follow some of the stuff. I'm still trying to kind of get into it. I've got a little bit of that old school mentality. I'm still the guy that wants to carry his, you know, books in his uh, cargo pocket and stuff like that. I'm still trying to embrace this Marty's laughing. I'm tr- I did an episode like, I don't know, four or five episodes ago about uh, EMS apps. And I'm going to tell you, I learned a lot of crap. And I was like, I don't even use any of these apps. And I'm having to like try to figure this out because, hey, you know, yeah, I do this. And I'm pretty tech savvy. I will give you that. I am pretty tech savvy. But I just I have not embraced it from an EMS standpoint yet as far as that kind of tech. So whenever I'm teaching the, the um, critical care class, I always joke and say we should probably we use our phones for something more useful than Twitter and Facebook, although I'm just as guilty as the next guy because I'm on my phone tweeting all the time. Otherwise, I would never get anything done, right? Uh, but <laughs> anyway, we, uh, I always tell them, find an app, find something that you like. Just like you have that little flip guide that's uh, so old and has a uh, – I know your flip guide has something – your flip guide is actually a stone tablet. However, uh, they have made new ones, and they're a little bit better for uh, – uh, flipping through things Stop and everything. The dust off of it. Else, but the stuff on your electronic. <laughs> yeah, I have the same one. And the stuff on electronic form, though, is just so awesome at 2.33 o'clock in the morning. It's so accessible, and it's right there. You can't always uh, – I mean, you can find that stuff in the flip guide. I like it. But I like you don't have extra stuff in your pockets. Trust me, my pockets are full enough. You know, I can understand from a fl- – and that's the thing about you guys who do critical care and right. You guys know I'm a big guy. I don't I don't fit on a helicopter. Uh, but, you know, you guys who do ride the helicopter, I mean, space is a commodity. So I can understand the social media aspect, or I should say the electronic, not the social media, but the uh, uh, electronic aspect. Uh, but, you know, we've been talking about Twitter, and, and Periscope is part of Twitter. I asked Marty before the broadcast, and he was like, what are you talking about? Blab. Have you heard of Blab? This is this new thing. Have you, are you familiar with that? Marty said he had not heard of it. I'm familiar with it. have not used it. I've tried to watch a couple. I messed around and did some tests today. i got to say, uh, some of the people who I follow who are like the social media gurus that I watch to try to learn new things, they're all about it. Mm-hmm. What is it? I have, I'm not convinced again. Blab. B-L-A-B dot I. What is it? It's something. So basically what they did is they took a Google Hangout. They took Skype. And they made a program that's kind of like both of them, but better. It allows you to, it, for one, it doesn't crash like Hangouts does sometimes. And so it's like a better uh, way for, so it's set up where it's, I mean, a bunch of people can be in the room and they can chat and this, that, and the other. But you have four different seats. It's kind of like having a table with four seats at it and a bunch of people are in the room. And only four people can sit at the table and talk at one time, but people yeah. out in the room can, you know, raise their hand and ask questions. And so, and if somebody gets up from the table, then somebody can go, yeah, I want to sit at the table. And so it's kind of cool to really interact that way. Um, and you can sit it and you can just do it yourself. You can just do it and it does record and things like that and it goes live. So uh, it's kind of cool the way it uh makes it a little more organic, easy to kind of work with, and lets it uh, be a little more natural flowing. Um, So it's kind of an interesting uh, thing. Now, Facebook, that's the evil of all evils, right? We love to hate Facebook. Um, I got to say that I was drug into Facebook several years ago, and I was like, oh, my God, this is kind of silly. I just, uh, and I found it an easy way. I'm actually not originally from Georgia. I grew up in North Alabama. Most of my family lives there. Um, have friends that live all over the world. And so it was an easy, especially for being in the Marine Corps, I have friends that live all over. And it's been a 
fascinating and awesome way for me to connect. And I think you guys probably feel the same way um, with people, family, friends, whatever. And I actually have two different Facebook accounts. I have a private one that I just interact with my family with. And then I have a public one, which I interact with friends, guys like you, people I you know, work with, uh, students and things like that. And it's always <clears throat> been good for me. But I found out, so I told you guys I was going to tell you about something I did this week. So I had a student or was not one of my students, but she is a student, send me a message and was like, you know, really upset and frustrated. Well, I come to find out she had been on a Facebook closed group set up specific for students to ask questions. So I went into this group because she actually called me in tears and I was like, what is going on? Well, I figured it out. So I put up this sort of kind of impartial, well, um, I was actually surprised I got the response I did, but I basically said, why do we as per, per peers and professionals feel like it's necessary that we have to belittle and berate people on these blogs, on these posts, Facebook, Reddit, uh, any kind of blog that's out there. It seems like it's people's sole goal is instead of helping people is to just like belittle, berate them and just make them... I mean, people are calling them stupid and idiots, and you've got no business doing this, and it's just, um, and it was interesting to see so many people, um, I think now it's up to somewhere around about 300 responses or plus, or people that like it, and probably 150 to 200, maybe more actual responses to it uh, within the group, and I was really surprised at people who stood up on both sides of the aisle. And I was kind of wondering what you guys think. We've been talking a little bit here, Marty. So what do you think about people who uh, kind of get on these social media sites and really kind of do that? Not just even just for EMS, but just for anything. So I don't participate in Facebook. So I'm a big, I like Quora. I like Reddit. Whoa, that's a new one. What's Quora? So Quora is a community. It, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like Reddit in a way, but it's kind of a a merge between Reddit and LinkedIn. So you have Reddit where there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. There's people asking questions, answering questions, and then you have LinkedIn where it's more, it's just who you are. So if you merge Reddit and LinkedIn together, people are asking a whole bunch of questions about like, you know, I'm involved in oil and gas quite a bit. So oil and gas, what's going on? What's happening with the prices so low? How do you maneuver with the prices being low? Um, more entrepreneurial stuff. So startup talking about venture capitalists, um, but I do know, so part of an aspect of what I do is kind of come to understand the educational market with an EMS and how to necessarily penetrate it from a business perspective. Um, one of the things that I found, obviously, is that it's complicated in terms of the different market segments. So public, private, federal, state, local, all private ambulance companies that are small, bigger, uh, state regulations, national county, city, all this stuff. People get paid differently. But the one thing that I found in talking to, obviously you guys are educators, but educators at community colleges, educators at different ambulance companies, is there seems to be this fight. <clears throat> and then there's this fight between doing things the old way and then doing things kind of teaching a in a different style. And I think what gets brought up, have you ever heard of pathophysiology? Of course. <laughs> yeah. So some educators are just stuck in their way. They do their things. They're not open to changing anything. And then the others are more embracing. There's pathophysiology, and then there's another didactic, I think. Yeah. So this, these concepts and what all what, – so I pay attention to a lot, a lot of EMS and social media, and there's fights. So they'll go through an NREMT question, how to answer the question. And then the and obviously when you study for the NREMT, you come to find out that there's two right questions, and one is more right than the other, right? The answers, yeah, yeah, sometimes yes, the answers for the most part. And then people will fight back and forth constantly over the process, who's right, who's wrong. It's insane. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? You guys are both educators. <laughs> I'll let you go. You, go let me ask you this. How do you feel even being in your world and on social media as prominent as you are? I mean, do you think you're going to get kind of attacked 
And then what do you do from a business perspective about that? Was that directed to me, Marty? Both of you guys. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead first, Clint. So the the thing that, that I, I – that was what, one of the first reasons why I never wrote anything at first. Uh, now I've written a lot of different things for blogs. Um, currently write for anywhere between uh, five and ten blogs if I do guest posts and stuff like that. Uh, now I don't – uh, to, for lack of better terms uh, or things, I don't really care. If you want to have a, uh, an intellectual conversation with me about what has come uh, about because I wrote about something controversial, for example, with FlightBridge, I wrote about um, sepsis care and looking at sepsis. Uh, this next one that I'm looking at is sepsis bundles and like kind of breaking it down. Uh, for, from that point on, the whole the whole purpose is to generate talk, not to say you're right uh, or wrong or – and that's not my opinion either. When I write these things, I'm not saying somebody's right or somebody's wrong. I'm just writing these papers and putting things out there so that people can say, hey, hey, you know what? I read that. I'm going to read more about that. It's more of a thought-provoking process and not necessarily saying somebody's right or somebody's wrong. Going back to what John said, you know, there are so many people that just get on these sites and they, they, they berate each other about what they did or didn't do. And I think that we kind of have to get away from that old mentality of um, like high school football. Whenever you're the upperclassmen and the underclassmen right. come in, you, you haze them and you make them feel like they're, you know, about this tall uh, instead of uh, encouraging them and making them feel like they own a piece of this team. Uh, do or not Dr. Um, <laughs> Eric Bauer, who owns Flightbridge Ed, he says, um, you know, it's all about who you collaborate with. And he wrote a piece for the blog called uh, Magnifying the Genius in Others. And it's about encouraging and creating that, that culture in which we encourage each other to move forward and uh, make each one of us the best that we can be. Not that either one of us is going to make each other a physician or anything else, but that we both try to obtain the knowledge level of that, that physician that you're, you're actually working under. It's interesting that you say that because a lot of what you guys are going through and what I'm reading and researching in EMS, the oil and gas industry is going through. So oil and gas is predicated on safety and mm -hmm. how do we get the most oil out of the ground and have no one die, right? That's, it, right. that's the number one thing about oil and gas is safety, which people don't know. That is water, believe it or not, which is kind of odd. But yeah, there's this fight between these you know, even though the oil got, oil prices are low and there's a lot of people getting laid off, there's a lot of money to be made right now in oil and gas in the, in the refinery. So they turn it in from gas to plastics. But there's this fight between the young guys who want to kind of come in and innovate and produce new technologies and create more efficiencies. And then the old guys that are more, um, let's just keep things safe. No one died doing it this way. Let's not change it. And, and that's it. And it's just a constant struggle. Yeah, no, I agree. And and when I was in North Carolina, a lot of uh, people wanted to know, you know, what's your goal? Like, what do you really want in your life in emergency medicine? And, and more importantly, academic emergency medicine and things. Uh, I basically confessed that I would love to try to change education, the way we teach paramedics, the way we learn. Uh, and, and I can't do that by myself, obviously. I'm only one person. But if we have this, this strong thought process from a lot of people that we need education. We need more education. We need more structure. And we need to come together at a national table and say, these are the things, the standards that we need to uphold, not just have this national standard that say, if you want to be an accredited community college to teach this, you have to do this, this, and this. But to have a national standard and almost like a board to say, hey, this is how we need to do it and follow through with that. And, and I don't know. I know we're going to get a lot of backlash from the old timers of, well, we don't need all this education and training in order to go out and practice this. No, but I know that uh, a lot of my friends who practice in the UK and Australia and things like that, they are better off and have a better understanding of pathophysiology uh, and things like that for their patients whenever they have their baccalaureate degree and spend a year as an intern, basically third writer for a year uh, and do that stuff. Uh, I know we grumble about it and things like that here in America, but the system that we have here is it's, it's adequate, but it could be so much better if, if that makes any sense. Can you change it using social media? So I know I don't want to I don't want to use companies. Ah, there's a guy that I know really well that I help out 
uh, actually a family that does really well. And you guys know them as well. I'm not going to mention them. We could maybe edit that. But um, can no, it's you fine. change? It's fine. Huh? It's fine. It's fine. But um, can do you think you can do what you want to do through social media? I tell absolutely. You, both of you no, guys. No, absolutely. You know what? I, I'll, I'll I'll be the one to say it, and I don't I don't I don't mind saying it. Um, who he's talking about is uh, Dan Limmer, uh, and I will say oh. that yes, uh, you can change people's thought processes. Uh, about EMS and how we think about it. I've seen him, his company on Twitter. Uh, I've seen him on Facebook, and it's the and it's the thing that we started talking about this. And I kind of told my little story there, and it's the that we've been hinting at. But it's that professional level. Every comment that I've ever seen him make or somebody from his company make is a professional comment. That okay, I understand what you have to say. I validate and I uh, and I. It's okay for you to have that opinion, but here's the right way to do it, or here is the uh, method that should be done, and he attacks it that way. And I think if we start just slowly chipping away at it, that whole, okay, I understand that, and I'm one of those guys, uh, I don't know how you like, you're probably pretty close to my age, or in between my and Marty's age, you've probably been in... EMS for 15, 20 years. I've been in EMS for over 20 years. We're kind of the old guys now. And I've always had that mentality of what's the next new thing? Now, yes, I kind of rebuff social or I guess I, should, I rebuff uh, the whole uh, electronic age a little bit in EMS. But it's that whole new next thing. We need to get excited about it. We need to look at the not so much the education, it's the model we use. So you said the guys in uh, Canada and, and stuff and how they, their pathophysiology, I had a conversation with a student today and one of the things we we're talking about is, well actually the student mentioned, there were several of us and the student mentioned to another student about, you know, they recommended that, hey, you might want to take an AMP class. And we started kind of expounding on that and kind of working into it. And I'll honestly, this is my personal opinion. Yes, I do have a, an associate's degree in EMS. I have a bachelor's degree. Uh, I've almost got a bachelor's degree in uh, two different sciences uh, and in mathematics. So I'm pretty close into about two or three other degrees. And so, I, yes, I am a big proponent of education. But I mm -hmm. think even at the basic level, before I ever got any, anywhere near to an advanced degree, just to the um, associates level. I think that even at that level, if we take those base science courses, like you said, take an anatomy and physiology course, take one, take the other. So take an anatomy course, take a physiology course, take a basic biology course, take those basic mathematic courses. Heck, we even need to take those English courses. I saw a thing last year, and this is another reason why social media is is awesome and us having now having the internet and things like that. I saw an article, you may have seen it, Clint. There was a group out in uh, Colorado that their coal company went to dictating PCRs simply because the writing was so bad for the service, they couldn't pay the bills. They, they're writing, writing the narratives and things like that. They couldn't document thoroughly enough to even get paid. And it was causing the company to almost look, so they had to go, okay, we've got to step back. And so taking something as simple as just taking an English class and learning how to write complete full sentences, paint the yeah. picture. And, um, you know, yeah, and we kind of got a little bit away from social media and was, we started talking about education there. And that's kind of good. I guess that's maybe your part of your mystery topic there, uh, Marty, that you're adding in. But, uh, you know, you asked earlier um, about being public. Uh, and I think that it has been good and bad for me. Um, the good thing is, is currently, as I knock on wood, I haven't really had anybody attack me. Um, and that's the good thing. But the bad thing is, is when you're in the limelight, when you start adding yourself into social media, you start doing things like this. Um, you start getting out in public. I've been to three different EMS conferences this, or expos this year. I'm going to another one uh, as it comes up, uh, the EMS Expo 2016, and, and they're in Baltimore. People are going to start knowing who I am by face, and you kind of have to be on point. It's kind of like Clint said earlier. You know, you kind of got to know your stuff, and you, 
whether you piss people off or not, you know, it's that presence that you have. So social media, I think, is good or bad. I don't know. So I did have um, a sort of something like that, uh, Marty. A, a couple weeks ago I did some live education airway topics and stuff for some of our ground services because we have ground stations as well as uh, air stations. And I was doing that for the ground, and they say, um, you know, one of them told the manager that he felt that I was – I came off as a little bit cocky. And the manager knows me personally, and she said, you just don't know him well enough, and he is, you know, pretty appropriate and all this other stuff. Uh, I think the problem uh, wasn't so much that he thought that that's how I, I was, but just because there was a lot that was asked, there were a lot of questions that came at me rapid fire, and I answered them just like we do whenever we're teaching John. And uh, I don't know if it was just the, the education level or what the disconnect was exactly because I was doing very basic airway management type stuff, nothing really uh, too advanced there, just some basic stuff there, and uh, yeah, you just kind of got to roll with the punches. I, I, I approached the individual, and we kind of uh, hashed out our, our little differences, nothing argumentative or anything very professional, but I think you just kind of, the problem with social media is you don't have that opportunity to, to actually talk to them face-to-face -face about it. Uh, that's probably the biggest issue. We can say a lot of things and be very big and bad behind the keyboard. Yeah. So. Yeah. In my mind, even, and I don't know if we want to go down this road, but if you guys kind of advocate for a certain way of doing things within social media and then something happens in a helicopter or on an ambulance, then their lawyer is going to go back and look at that. Then what happens? Do you know what you, like, yeah, I mean, that's a whole no, I, but so you're kind of, kind of talking about like the whole thing with like Facebook, how people are losing their jobs or they're not getting hired because of stuff they pictures or comments and stuff like that they yeah, make. But you, guy, yeah, but your guys is different, right? So yours is life and death. Yeah. Like pretty much every day. So if you're writing about something and then you do something and then this person happens to possibly pass away or something happens and then a lawyer gets wind of it, then they're going to go and research you and research what you wrote what you produce to research this video and then they can make a case to do something to to cause you know to act on it like that that to me would mm -hmm. that would scare me in your position yeah so the the biggest thing that we always do at doesn't see me flight bridge wherever i'm uh, currently doing things at the time is always always follow your local protocols procedures and guidelines and your direction of the medical direction you have that is how i always caveat things you know i know that lawyers can make a case for anything they can dig things they can find it but if you always say you know even eric wrote a piece and we should probably do something similar uh over at distance cme uh, but he wrote a piece that was strictly hey look we produce all this stuff we give out the most evidence-based practice that's out there. We talk about it. We, we, we teach about it. We do all this stuff, but we're not saying that you should go to your, your uh, place of employment and use push dose pressers tomorrow. Uh, you definitely have to follow your local protocols, procedures, and guidelines. We are just putting out the biggest and best, latest and greatest, uh, evidence-based medicine that's out there. The whole purpose of what we do is to give them the best that's out there right now so that they understand and that it's up to them. We're gonna we're showing them the door. They have to walk through it, uh, but they have to formulate their own opinions, their own things. And uh, I, I'm very strong in my opinions as far as medicine goes, and I've had discussions with, uh, with uh, paramedics and nurses on the critical care. Uh, yeah, and, and so we we know that that we're going to have those conversations. But yeah, that's a great point. I, I never even thought about that, but that's the first thing that popped into my head. I never thought of it either, Marty. Uh, that's funny you say that. I never thought of it either. I'm a snarzy capitalist type of guy. I look for opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what snarzy means. So we we I think made it up. We, we've been talking about some of these social media aspects for a little bit, um, and uh, I think this has been a good conversation. So let's shift gears a little bit. I know this one's going to be run a little longer, but I think when we add in more people, that's okay. I think people will watch it, and if they don't, well, I had fun doing it anyway. Uh, so, Marty, ding, ding, tag, you're it, man. What's My the mystery topic? Or have you kind of added? Or have you added in your mystery topic already? 
I have not, but I'm going to steal one from Reddit, and it's a simple one. Okay. And it's and I'm going to use the name. So it's Wrangler Mike 06 on Reddit. Stethoscope recommendations for paramedics EMTs. I wouldn't even think that that would you just get a stethoscope and you put it on, you listen to it, and that's it. Was there any different type of choices that you can make other than a stethoscope? No, Clint. Yeah. No, I'll let you answer first. So, not- <laughs> uh, well, the nurse that I work with today, um, she has one of those ones that uh, you can actually record the heart sounds and stuff like that, and you can hear pretty much anything anywhere. Uh, those are expensive, and those are those are very nice. Uh, I personally live and die by uh, Littman Cardiology 3. That's been my go-to uh, ever since I started in, yeah, in medicine. I love the Cardiology 3. I have the same one that I had uh, when I first started as an EMT. Um, so it's, not, it's always done me really well. As far as pediatric stethoscopes go, uh, I have a separate Littman for that. But, uh, I, yeah, there's definitely a difference. Those ones that some of those companies you've probably worked for in the past that are um, – they almost look like they're just a little bit better than the uh, child doctor kit that you might find for your kids. Um, yeah. Th- yeah. Uh, you've seen those, and they're ra- always wrapped up in the webbing that's uh, next to the bench seat in the ambulance, yes. right? So, or laying on the back uh, of the bench seat or somewhere, yeah. In the floor. Never where the stretcher out never of the yeah, they're never where they need to be. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely a choice. And for me, and I, and I don't take any money from uh, Littman or anyone else, no monetary compensation there, but uh, Littman is probably my, my favorite, the Cardiology 3, uh, most notably. You know, they are the gold standard, I think, Bobby, John. For, for medicine. And, you know, me, so I'll answer it from a different perspective because, yes, my, so, um, it was kind of my thing. This is what I wanted. Uh, and oh gosh, 15 years ago, maybe my wife bought me a Littman cardiology three, two sided. Uh, and I will say, so here's my answer to you. I am a fan of the two sided stethoscope. Now my wife, uh, who is, uh, she was in EMS for a while. She was a trauma nurse for a uh, better part of a decade. And, uh, She's a one-sided fan, and I have I have inadvertently grabbed her stethoscope walking out the door before, not paid attention, throw it around my neck and go, ah, I got to work and go, eh. So I will say this, and I tell, this is what I tell my students, know how to use both of them, but, you know, find your preference because it does take a little more manipulation. I'm a big fan of the two-sided. Littman, pretty much anything, yes, if I could afford the big money, I might would buy one of those. I don't know. I'd probably break it, so I probably wouldn't need to buy one of those that uh, has all the electronic stuff in it. But Cardiology 3 is kind of my go-to. That, that's me. It's a little heavier, but it's my go-to. So, yeah. Are there digital yeah. stethoscopes where it's kind of like there's a computer chip inside of it and it goes to the iPhone and kind of reports stuff or – yeah, so the one that she has, you can Bluetooth, um, you can Bluetooth it to your phone and stuff like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, do those have like a little uh, SD card or something in them, or is it just like you it it records the stuff on a memory and then you just Bluetooth it over to your phone or something? How's that work? Yeah, that, that that's how it works. Is you Bluetooth it over to your phone and just records it, stays in the recording, and then you kind of have to just get it by Bluetooth over there. I know there are some that plug in, just like you plug in and sync your iPhone or whatever. It just depends on what you buy. So do those allow for you to be able to integrate that information into the electronic PCR? You know, that's a good question. I have never, I've never thought about that. Yeah, I've never thought about that at all. Um, that is a very good question. That's our million dollar idea, Clint. We're gonna- yeah, I was saying, is there some, is that something we should invent? Uh, we maybe we should. It all started right here. <laughs> <laughs> this is our proof, doggone it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, tell that to the lawyer, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would never be that lucky. Did you guys buy your uh, tickets, your uh, lottery tickets? We did as a crew. We bought. We went. We all chipped in some money and we bought some. The last time, I think we spent, I don't know, a hundred or some dollars. All of us chipped in a little bit. I think we won sixteen bucks. <laughs> so uh, we'll see what happens. 
What about you, Marty? Did you buy your lottery tickets, man? I did. I did. Yeah. So uh, you're going to be I'm going to be hooked up for life, right, if you win? You got me? I don't know. I think it would be the worst thing that ever happened to me is to win the lotto. I'll say that. Uh, I would disappear. I'd change my name and disappear. I don't know what I'd do. Uh, yeah, that's crazy, man. I think I would still, you know, I tell my wife, she goes, so you're going to kill, still keep doing that? I'm like, well, you know, we've got school age kids, so i got to have something to do while they're in school. Yeah, I think I'd still, still keep, uh, uh, teaching or whatever, but uh, I'd spend a lot more time on the trails, uh, hiking and running in the mountains and stuff like that. I don't know. Well, it's like the, there's two things I say. So the future, Marty, always looks better than the present one. And then my favorite color to kind of combat that is mirror. Huh? Let, let that sink in. <laughs> uh,. I'll go so to bed start to thinking about what what you would do with things. The reality of it never occurs, rarely. Yeah. Oh yeah. I get yeah. That. Yeah. And mirror is my favorite color, so self reflection, right? I got you. I got you. Got it. Yeah. Nice. I like that. I don't know about the future me looking better, uh, but uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Well, you're not going to go uh, get up tomorrow and have more hair, just like I'm not going to be taller whenever I get up in the morning. So, It's funny you said something about the hair. I actually did get a haircut, and Marty didn't know, say anything. But uh, when you've only got about three or four and you just sort of kind of trim them down, people don't really notice. I've never had any hair, so I, I had never really cared. But uh, I am yeah. the father of two daughters, and I've been in EMS for a while. It's white. Yeah, you've earned it. <laughs> it's white. Uh, the oldest is 15. She'll be 16 next month. It's about time to dig a, a, a moat, get some alligators and buy a gun or something. <laughs> just do what my dad did. When my sister started bringing boys home, he just took out a shotgun from the gun safe and wrote their name on it and put it on the TV stand. That's awesome. I like yeah. that. I like that. One, That's good stuff. One boy never came home, came back, and uh, she ended up marrying one of the other ones, so I guess it didn't scare him off too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy, man. So uh, what else you got for us tonight, Marty? Anything? Uh, well, speaking of kids and stuff, how do relationships work in your industry? Because you guys work crazy hours. You experience crazy stuff. You got to come home. Like, how can you see someone die or get shot at, come home to your wife, and have a normal life? Like, explain that. How old are your kids, Clint? Um, one is almost five. They'll be five in a couple months. And the other one is just today, five months old. So wow. um, very big difference in age. Um that is probably one of the biggest stressors in my life, actually, Marty, is trying to balance that life and work. Because uh, not only do I have all the stuff that I do um, in my life, but I also am in the military. So I'm gone a lot. And then to to do all these things and be gone all the time and, and everything, which uh, I always said that, you know, if I was on some sort of a podcast or something, I would say this, but uh, I owe my wife a lot. Uh, she she's always at home with the kids and taking care of them. And she uh, allows me to be able to do a lot of the things that I've done with my professional career and, and with my education. So I thank her for that. But the big thing that you bring up is, yeah, how can you do this in everyday life and then come home and have act like nothing has happened? It's hard to do. It's, I'm not going to lie. It's not, you can't just shut it off. It's uh uh, just like me in medicine in general, I can't shut it off. I, I come home and people are calling me or, or I teach, you know, and, and something uh, comes up. I, it's just constantly going on. So it's, it's hard to have a n normal relationship. But one thing that, that, that I always tell people is, look, you're never going to work normal hours. It's always going to be like this unless you find yourself administrative or, or doing teaching or something like that. You're always going to work crazy hours in healthcare, period. It doesn't matter if you're in EMS or if you're a doctor or a nurse or whatever. You're going to work crazy hours. You're going to see things that normal people shouldn't see, and uh, you have to find an outlet. Uh, whether it's your, your spouse, which usually uh, a lot of us aren't married to or even in relationships with people in this industry, and some are, but uh, my wife is not an EMS. She's in healthcare, but uh, it'd be like comparing. 
she's she's a physical therapist, so it's like comparing a, a dermatologist to an emergency room doc. You know, I mean, you it's, can't. Compare, it's interesting compare. you say that because I've had a different experience. Uh, in uh, most of the people that I've worked with and known, a lot, a large percentage of them are their spouse is somebody in healthcare, and a lot of times it's somebody in EMS because that's who you spend the most time with. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So those are most of my friends, though. Most of my friends are in EMS or healthcare. Uh, it's funny because that's the that's the the huge thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, my relationship, you know, and marriage is with somebody who's in healthcare but not EMS. And then everybody else that I spend my time with are either nurses, doctors, or in EMS. Um, you know, here's the way I'll answer your question. So I told you my oldest uh, daughter is 15. When she was about uh, maybe three or four, she picked up the phone and called 911 because she wanted to talk to daddy. Really? Yes. And uh, I think that that's always kind of stuck with me. And I've thought about, and I spent a lot of time, like Clint, I spent a lot of time away from home. I spent a lot of years in their formative years when my kids were younger. My kids are older now. Uh, and I, as I have progressed through different roles within EMS, uh, whether it was through training uh, or management, or maybe I was able to work shifts where I worked mostly day shifts. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I do primarily education. Um, so I get to spend a lot more time. Uh, my wife has uh, always been in healthcare. Like I said, she was an EMS and she was a nurse. And it was like the, we did the high five, how you doing on the way? Or, you know, we might have called each other on the phone, that, you know, the, hey, the kids are with so-and-so, or, you know, uh, I'm, meet me at a certain place, we need to swap kids kind of thing. And, you know, that was kind of it uh, for a long time. So, yeah, I, I think uh, Clint and I both have had some of the same experiences. And a lot of people in EMS do, and it's just, it's really hard to have kids. It's hard to, you have to have that spouse that does kind of understand. And uh, my wife and I have taken turns. Uh, over the years trying to work out our schedule to uh, it's kind of been my job now to spend more time at home with the kids um, she's a nurse and we know that nurses they make more money and now that she's in management she works for the federal government uh, so that makes it even better so we've kind of yeah you kind of have to figure out that balancing act and you know we have opted and I'll say this we've been fortunate we never did uh child care for our kids. One of us was always able to work it out where we could stay home with our kids or even, and now that our kids are school age kids, we've worked it out with our schedules and we planned and stuff like it. We've been fortunate. I will say not everybody in EMS is, and it's tough. And you have to have somebody who understands and somebody you can come home and talk to decompress because yeah, I'm one of those people, I leave it at work, but uh, yeah, there's been days that I've came home and yeah, hugged my wife, kissed my kids a little, you know, because it was a tough day, you know? Do you guys get overly protective of your kids because of the things that you've seen? Um, I'm not there yet, but I will, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not there yet because my my, uh, my oldest right now, he's more interested in, um, you know, just playing outside and, and uh, whenever it's nice. And then uh, he loves to read books, so he reads all the time. So I don't really have to worry about him right now, but when he gets a little older, he'll start wanting to do adventurous things and, and everything else. And uh, I know whenever I'm around other kids, other people's kids, I'll be more protective and, and I'm more protective of other people, not just kids, but just people, you know, Hey, don't do that. I've seen some bad stuff happen for people doing that. So don't do that. You know? Yeah. You know, um, I only have girls. And so I think as a father of little girls, I have a different perspective. But, yeah, I think I'm probably a little more protective. I'm a, I had th I got three younger sisters. All my sisters are young, uh, all my sisters younger than me uh, growing up. And, you know, my parents were probably not as strict on my sisters as I am on my daughters. But, yeah, I think, yeah, Marty, you probably hit the nail on the head, the whole stuff we've seen. And then my wife was a sane nurse. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, Clint, but mm. sexual assault nurse. Yes. Instructor. So she did uh, yeah. that for a while. She was a program director here uh, at Fort Gordon for a while. And just having conversations with her, the stuff that we see is every day. You know, I worked in Atlanta, so you know how it is working in those major metropolitan areas and, you, and you're just like, holy crap. And you go home to your kids and go, I'm really going to put bars on the doors and lock it up and just, yeah, they're never going outside again. And it's tough. Right. It really is tough to kind of let go, release. So that's an excellent question, Marty. Yeah. 
I appreciate you guys answering. Now I know why I do not want to be an EMS. So uh, I, I've been occasionally. You guys want to take a guess how long we've been going? Anybody? Take a guess. I have no idea. Go for it, Marty. Uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> it goes by quick, doesn't it? 49 minutes and 43, 44 seconds. Nice. Uh, yeah, so usually we do these about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I knew that with having three people on here, it was going to be a little longer. Um, this has really been good stuff, guys. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I don't know that too many people going to hang out for uh, much longer than this. So uh, I think we'll wrap it up. But, Clint, I, I would love for you to come back, Guy. Uh, when I, think that would, I think that would be a good idea, John. Um, I uh, had a viewer send me a text message, and I think I had said something to you about it. Uh, and I think uh, maybe you can come back and we'll talk about that, uh, maybe a little bit about CPAP and some of that stuff. I think it was you that I sent the message to, right? Uh, yeah, about CPAP or something. You sent me a message, John. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe you can come back and we'll uh, spend a little talk, time talking about that. Uh, we'll work it out uh, here in the next few weeks or something. Uh, and uh, maybe we can teach Marty a little bit about what CPAP is. And uh, <laughs> Marty might have yeah. fun. He'll have some good questions. Sounds good. So, yeah. Sounds like, good. Uh, I think you guys, uh, Clint, I, <clears throat> I think you're extremely valuable. So I, I if this happens more often, that would be, I think, a good thing because the conversation went really well, I thought. Yeah. Except for my interruption. But it's, it looks like you got to go, Clint. No, no, no. It's, no, it's good. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you having me on, John. And uh, Marty, it was good to meet you and have some uh, good conversation. All right. Yeah, that was fun. Well, guys, that's really all the time that uh, we're going to take this week. So uh, for those of you out there in uh, the old social media land, viewing, hanging out uh, on uh, YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and like us there on the YouTube channel. You can even share on Facebook and Twitter. You can even go to my website, MedicLifeTV.com, to get the latest info and updates. And if you want to be that well-informed lifer, and I know you do, don't forget to go to the lifers list and sign up on the contact page. Guys, from here in Augusta, Georgia, my name is John. Thanks for joining with us. Marty there in good old Houston, Texas, and Clint in Nebraska. Guys, thanks for watching. This has been episode 21. Y'all stay safe out there. So